Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca. I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist, and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of laurel cards catfishes, also known as whiptail catfishes, um, plex, L numbers within the chrome trade. And today I'm actually going to talk about one, and I'm not actually going to talk about fish food this time. So today I'm going to talk about one group of plecos you probably shouldn't buy unless you really know what you're doing. And not know what you're doing in the uh, fish sense, but know what you're doing in the pleco law card sense. So rather than using the term plecos, it's more if you're going to use the term L numbers and law cards. Because these are not the easiest groups of fishes to keep. So today I'm going to talk about a group known as Barium Cistrus. They don't actually have a common name for this whole entire genus. And Barium Cistrus isn't actually a sort of a very concise group. It's actually kind of, so it has a central group and this would be uh, Xanthellus, which is the gold nugget. Chrysolemus, which is also known as mangoes or magnums. A 142. And then a few others that you rarely see within the aquarium trade itself. Now there are other fishes called barren citrus, so you might have seen L200A or the high fin green phantom. This is at... So I'm going to talk about a genus of laurel carids or plecos that you might be very familiar with actually. They're very common and very popular. So this is barren citrus, and I'm going to focus on what I'll call the stem or true barren citrus. So this is barren citrus xanthellus, the gold nugget, barren citrus chrysolemus, the mango magnum pleco, L142, which sometimes gets called the true snowball, but it's one of the snowball plecos and it's the largest one, and then a load of other species and L numbers that you rarely see within the aquarium trade, including variants of all of these species. So there are other barren sisters, and these are because the name is kind of vague but it refers to it's what's known as polyphyletic so not all of them are actually closely related or come from one ancestor it's sort of the simplest way of explaining it anyway so there is barren citrus dermatoides and this is the high fin green phantom there's barren citrus beginny which is the blue black panak or the blue panak but all of these have L numbers. Um, we've also got for there's L two hundred goes to, for Baranthus dermatoides, also Himesus subverides, which is the green phantom, as I mentioned earlier. And then there's also um, uh, like I think those are the main ones. But there might be a few sort of L numbers undescribed that are in that kind of group. This group being part polyphyletic, there's dotted. Amongst them is also Hemian Cistrus, so uh, sister to Dermatoides is Hemian Cistrus uh, Subvir Verdis, and also um, as an extension of Blue Phantom, which is L128, which is probably the same species. So I'm going to focus on the stem barren Cistrus as I discussed before, because they are entirely different to care for. They are actually, um, while they're not distantly related, there is sort of some other groups in between. So we've got Spectrocanthicus, um, I don't think they really have a common name, and then we've got also Paranthicus, which is like the chubby plecos. So, which can look actually quite similar, and are much more similar in other ways to Spectrocanthicus, but not all Spectrocanthicus, this is another clade or group which is polyphyletic. So anyway, I'm going to get on to why you really shouldn't look at keeping barium cistrus in the hobby or as a pet fish uh, or even looking to breed them unless you really know what you're doing. So true barium cistrus are firstly not small fishes. The smallest one would be around 20 centimetre standard length 
but many are reaching over 30 centimeter standard length. There is no real reliable estimates on how big they get to because the larger wild ones are, don't seem to be fished that much. Sometimes they come into a trade and not. But you have to be prepared that if you're going to keep this fish healthy, especially if you want to breed it, they're going to get to larger sizes. And what comes with larger sizes is they're much more boisterous than they seem. They're not small skinny fishes. These are bulky fishes who will move decor. These, this bit of wood gets moved constantly by some of mine and even not the largest one can shift the wood and shift all of these caves should they want to and when they want to. The main reason I do not recommend barren cistrus at all is that they are actually very specialist when it comes to that. These fishes are specialist alcohols and you might think oh but I can feed um, Hikari algae wafers or I can feed um, Dr. Basil Corella. Firstly, those have very little algae in and they're not going to sustain this fish to get the fish to grow. They're not going to get the fish to breed. Um, breeding is extremely rare. But they're not going to be able to keep those fish long term. You're wanting a diet that is very high in algae. They do feed on bacteria, protozoa, um, potentially sponges in the wild but they definitely need this diet they're um, in the wild when you look at their intestines and stuff like that it's very high in algae anyway so they're almost like cows the way they're grazing and it's not just infrequent feeding it's constant feeding like cows they're grazing on this algae constantly and you'll notice that when they're fed those more carnivorous diets, they're not really growing, they're not really even living as long as they should. So generally looking at that algae based diet, and sadly due to diets in captivity, the fish foods we have available, that really limits us to Rapashi Solent Green with additional algae added in, Rapashi Super Green, uh, Pleco Pops, and also New Life Spectrum Algae Max to a degree. But it does mean adding more algae in there. and many people might be like oh but I can add vegetables, they're plants anyway. Firstly algae are also polyphyletic. Algae are just a, anything photosynthetic it seems that is not a plant. Um, so it's kind of dotted throughout the tree of life these groups. They're much higher in protein, they're very different nutritionally to providing plants. Also, the main difference I think is that cellulose. Plants, the way they're structured, particularly when it comes to terrestrial plants, they're structured in a way to hold themselves up, which means they've got much more, um, they're much more difficult to digest because of the cellulose, the, um, just the structures in general. And these fishes are not adapted for that anyway. If they were adapted, it wouldn't be an issue, but there is little plants where they come from and when they, there is plants, it's not the ones they feed on, there's other fishes that feed on those plants. They're focusing on algae. So vegetables are not going to suffice. If you actually keep these fishes, you'll notice that when you're feeding courgette or anything like that, it produces a lot of waste because they're not processing as much of it because they can't process as much of it. So it's not nutritionally comparable. This does make, because they're feeding so often on an expensive diet, it makes them a much more expensive fish to keep than if you're going to keep pipe and cistrus or if you're going to keep any of those other fishes. So for the nutritional reason, I do not recommend them. They are a lot of work when it comes to that and also a little bit more expensive to feed. But there's other reasons that make this fish a little bit more expensive than many might think. Barren cistrus or the stem barren cistrus actually come from rivers like the Rio Jingu, especially the ones we buy. This also means that they're actually really high temperature fish. That's about 28 degrees minimum. And people might say, oh, but I've kept them at 25 degrees. Firstly, they're not going to grow as well, they're not going to be able to digest their food as well. 
you don't see many long-lived ones at those lower temperatures. They, the rivers that they come from, the Rio Jingu, particularly, this is where mo most of them are fished from that we keep. That is a minimum of 28 degrees. Often it goes well above 30. The consideration is with high temperatures is that oxygen saturation actually decreases at higher temperatures. So then you're battling that oxygen saturation with, with higher temperatures, which is why I don't go above around 29.5 degrees. This also does mean that they're very limiting on tank mates, and there's other reasons why that I'll go through in a bit why they're very limiting on tank mates that limits what you can keep them with and maybe it depends on what your experience with or knowledge on other fishes to whether you can keep them with them hence why i've always had discus with mine or mostly had discus with mine but for many people i wouldn't recommend discus so i'll go into that in a bit major reasons I don't recommend it then is because they're largely only popular because of this coloration. So you'll see these juveniles with these beautiful seams, those large spots, or even with the Chrysolimus, very bright green with large yellow seams. That's a juvenile trait. They lose these seams with age, so those sort of very, those stripes along the fins, those go with age. So they will not hold those as a mature fish. The other thing is spotting. So Chrysolimus doesn't have spotting, so that's the, man the mango. Um, also L47. Xanthelus and L142 do have spotting. And L142 seems to hold it a little bit better. But that spotting gets very small and very minimal with age. So you've almost got a dark coloured fish with minimal seams to no seams, so it's very different from the fish you brought. And that juvenile coloration lasts much shorter than the lifespan of the fishes. These fish can live decades. And they're not the fastest growing, but it really depends on how you keep them. So the major reason I don't recommend them is because you're buying a fish that is very different from what you expected. If you want a large fish that's going to hold on to its coloration, then Scopin and Citrus Oreatus is better. High temperatures, but a carnivore, so easier to feed, easier to get variety into their duck, grows a lot better. Also quite territorial, so it's a little bit more better for a lot of people in general. Or if you're wanting smaller, Susan Citrus Acerini, which I think is the gold seam pleco. That's a much flatter fish, but it holds on to those colours a little bit better, and it's just smaller in general. If you're wanting something like a gold nugget, then you're going to get a big fish that doesn't have much of that coloration you bought it for. Final reasons is these fish are actually really territorial. So barren sisters argue a lot, and it's not just with each other. They will argue. Well, they firstly mind do uh, musical chairs, musical caves all the time, constantly switching caves. Like this Zandella. So this is L81. He's or she has occupied those two caves for a while, but now he she doesn't want those caves and it doesn't matter if they're males or females my large one is a confirmed female she is a lot more nasty than the others because she could get away with it she's larger so she can actually uh, dominate the others and then move around decor but that aggression doesn't just um, apply to other little cards and the issue is is if they're much bigger they can overpower smaller species or individual much easier. So I wouldn't keep smaller ones unless they could potentially manage because I find my parent sister's L322 uh, isn't too bad of it. They are also found in the same habitat in the world so they're probably used to dealing with uh, barren sisters. But 
these guys will actually lunge and get smaller fish or any slow moving fish that are kind of in their territory in their way so I've seen them go after platys, they will go after discus if that fish can't move out of the way quick enough which discus, platys, most fishes can deal with that but that does limit tank mates, so I can't keep Brunocephalus traditional banjo catfishes with them. I have to go with Platystacus, which are a little bit more spicy, a little bit more feisty. If they're even just being bothered, they're off. They're not dealing with it. So you really have to consider tank mates when it comes to that. But the other aspect is that they might be territorial and not want fast, uh, so moving fish when it comes to that. But they also are really slow feeders, so you don't want anything fast feeding, so nothing like geophagus that can eat a lot in one go, or a lot of those sort of larger cichlids. Um, also, maybe a horde of live bears if you've got loads of guppies, loads of platys. There's so much when it comes to that sort of aspect of keeping barren cistrus. So my main point is really think when you're getting these fishes, they're not the easiest fishes, they cost a little bit, they're expensive, they're not the fish you probably thought they would be. A lot of people that say their fishes are peaceful and chilled, they've got juveniles, they haven't got nearly close to adults. They're long lived fishes so you've got this fish for a long time and reselling might not always be easy and if you want the money you bought them for back, that's really unlikely with these, um, or with fishes in general. And I haven't talked about breeding because they've rarely, if ever, been bred in captivity. Um, so there's like, for Xanthellus, there's maybe two, um, actually probably just under ten uh, people that have managed to breed the gold nuggets in captivity. L142, maybe slightly more. Chrysolimus, the mango magnums, I've never heard of anyone that has spawned them in captivity. So don't buy them expecting to make money off them, but also it shows the difficulty to actually keep them alive. And if you look at them, how few adults are actually around, how few people have ones, even of my size, so mine aren't fully grown. Largest one is about that big. Um, smallest about that big but most people have ones about that big and that goes to show if they were that easy to keep and then you'd see a lot more adults around and a lot more people spawning them so anyway I'm gonna end this video here it's a bit of a negative one but it gives ideas on how to keep them they obviously are higher um, high waste just due to volumes of food and they do like a good current but uh, Chrysolimus is a little bit more adaptable I guess of that um, they're just not easy to keep and I really don't recommend them if you want a colourful fish, Oreatus at that large size, Acerini at smaller and then looking at Hypencistrus for other sort of aquariums so anyway, thanks for watching if you like my videos please comment, like and subscribe and goodbye.